and over time it might not you know it might take you two weeks three weeks four weeks six months but eventually you keep practicing and then that will come and i think um from a perspective of you can do it take time that's where i think my hunger for things has come from is the sense of look i know that if you do work hard enough and you do stay the course those things will come and i think i was thinking about this before coming on and, and i thought you'd raise the question of of you know you like nice things and and moving towards that and i think i like having those things because i've earned it yeah you know and it's not like it's been given to me as i've earned it so why wouldn't i enjoy it that was shane harris and welcome back to another edition of the Harris Health and Mind podcast. Guys, welcome back to Harris Health and Mind podcast, or welcome to the Harris Health and Mind podcast. It's your first time listening. Today we've got on um, my brother, uh, Shane Harris. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's all right. Um, we're going to talk about business today um, and everything in terms of startups. Um, and hopefully you'll give us as much knowledge as, as possible. I'll um, do my best, yeah. Yeah, I'm sure you will. <laughs> um, first of all, I just want to start by saying um, a thanks uh, because you're someone uh, as well as a couple of others who helped me get into veganism. So <laughs> thanks for... Uh, I didn't sustain it myself. No, you didn't sustain it yourself. Yeah. What was it last night? Two salmons. Uh, <laughs> was it two salmons, two eggs and asparagus? Uh, there was no eggs. There was no eggs. Nah. Like two salmons. Oh, okay. yeah. Potatoes. Potatoes, it? It looked yeah. like scrambled eggs. But no, but t- oh, they were um, crushed potatoes actually with a bit of oh, sweet okay. chili in them. Oh, okay, fine. Nice. You right. could you could eat that, yeah. although there was butter in there. So, what the salmon? No, the potatoes. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, um, yeah obviously you was you were someone who uh, messaged me going, "Have oh, you watched What the Health?" Mm. Um, and I hadn't um, had a couple of mates who were vegan for a few years at that time, so I dabbled in a few things um, like meals and stuff. Um, but yeah, you were the first one to sort of be like, "Oh yeah, watch this." Um, and then from there overnight it's been literally like an overnight switch in a year and a half so yeah thanks for it even yeah, though you're welcome the same happened to me I was put onto it by yeah. um, Louis obviously you know my friend Louis yeah and um, I watched it and then the next day I was like right all the meat in the house is gone all yeah. the dairy's gone changed and then um, health is one of those things I think of as I've evolved through that after seeing that I think it's more specific to the person your diet works mm. for you and some diets don't and some yeah. do and I don't know if there's a blanket template but if you feel healthy and you feel good for it, well then, no, of course, carry on. Man. What was uh, what was the reason for not necessarily sticking it out? Um, I think because it was it's really tough to do. I think if you speak to anyone who is vegan, yeah. if you aren't committed to it, to go to a shop is hard because pretty much everything has some form of dairy in it somewhere or this or that, and you think yeah. it's so hard to get away from that stuff. And probably more so, I didn't really see, and probably because, and Louis says this a lot, who is a strong vegan, um, at Louis underscore Blake on Instagram, if you want to follow him. Um, He says this a lot, you can be vegan and you can still be unhealthy. And I think Mm. the choices I was making at that time were quick vegan options that were still unhealthy and I didn't feel any better for it. So I think I associated the fact that I didn't really feel that good Mm. with being vegan I thought well actually it's, it's not made me feel any better but, but it was probably more yeah. but they had like choices. the uh, finding out like the Oreos and yes. the crisps yes and, and, and I was like oh yes I can like still that. eat this stuff yeah of course so you consume more of that stuff when you want a bit of a sweet treat and you don't eat necessarily well and you think well chips okay well chips are vegan let's eat yeah, them yeah. and you're not eating the right things and salads can be boring if you don't know the right thing to yeah. eat and it's it's more I'm not a chef obviously I've, you nah. you are a considered to be better culinary skills than me but I can't go home every because I work so much you know yeah. I can't, it's hard to and it's an excuse I know but it's hard to get home late it's a great figure experience. out what you're gonna have to eat you really it's a lot of that is in prep work and knowing you've got the ingredients and really sitting down and thinking right I'm gonna commit to this and mm. um yeah I just hadn't I'm just yeah. not there yet it's, yeah, and like you say, I agree with you 100% that everyone's got their own um, path and um, in terms of what they want to do food-wise and, mm. s- and stuff like that. And if it works for them, that's great. Um, yeah, there's a few things that are difficult in terms of like the misconceptions and stuff like that. I think even little things like in, just in general, whether you're uh, plant-based, keto, um, whatever you tend to eat, that 
it's we're just sort of drummed in that you have to eat quickly now I think yeah um, you know yeah. like Joe Wicks for the 15 minute meals mm. or you know whoever Jamie Oliver 30 minute meals and that's stuff. true yeah that's um, true it is sort of drummed in that food needs to be quick and accessible I think that sort of tends to be like our daily life as well everything seems to be right get up ready go instant gratification yeah of course yeah. make something that's quick for breakfast if it's mm-hmm. not quick you're not having it or if you get home you need to have something that's quick so then even you can chill out and whatever your chill out is or mm. um you know you're doing something different so yeah it's different um but yeah check out louis lou does some good talks i think he's still great doing talks, some talks yeah. isn't he yeah um, he does some great talks um but yeah Big check out louis um and obviously um we might chat about him throughout because obviously he started uh yeah two restaurants as well so yes yes yeah, a good business there um so yeah that'll probably come up a little bit later yeah, yeah. For sure but good good segue into business because i think the instant gratification thing is something that people look at in business as well how do i get to this point very quickly and how do i make this much money by the end of the year and you yeah. know how how can i grow my business overnight when there is no overnight success it is building. yeah i think 100 percent. i think there's some stuff as well where people will look at um whether it's margins whether we we'll look at something that may catapult them to make quick money Mm -hmm. Um, but at the same time I sort of agree that you have to have some form of enjoyment in what you're doing or what you're selling yeah that is making you money Mm -hmm. um, or that may not be making you money for whatever reason at that current moment in time but yeah if you stick at it it will Um, so yeah um, talk about business Um, sort of want to I want to get into your story a little bit so tell tell the guys that are listening what um, what everything was like when you were growing up, childhood stuff. I want to get into that a little bit. Dive uh, into how that's shaping you in terms of your business now and, and as a person as well and how that sort of moulds molds everything together. Yeah, um, good question. It's obviously, growing up, I grew up with you, so you all know a little bit about that. Obviously, we had yeah. our own lives, but we, we started out in in East London. We were You and I were both born mm. in East London, in Hackney, and we moved um, all over the country, Manchester and then further down this way, down south, and, and ended up settling in Colchester ultimately for the majority of our lives, and that's where we have made our lives from there, really. Um, we had humble beginnings, to say the least. I remember there was times where, I tell this story a lot, there was times where we had sugar on toast as a treat. Mum mm. used to sell it to us as a treat, when really it was because that's all she could afford, but we were like, yeah, sugar on toast. Mm. Um, so yeah, we we came from a very, very humble background. You know, we didn't, suffer or I didn't see us as as we suffered you know we had me you Charmaine Charlie and we we're a nice tight-knit family unit and obviously there were times where we didn't have much but I never saw that as suffering you know I thought it was just mm. a case of this is normal and then as you grow up and you look around you and you you see people are slightly more privileged but I never thought that we had a underprivileged childhood I just thought that we had maybe slightly less of a head start than other people around us but never bitter about it it was just more of a case of this is where we are and this is where we start from yeah i mean it, it's difficult because it, it depends on what context you look at as like a humble beginning mm. and, and things like that mum whether mum uh, that was a conscious choice of mum's being a single parent of four kids two mixed race kids or three mixed race kids forgetting charm <laughs> <laughs> she's a bit too yeah, light to remember um, yeah and and charlie who who was white at what still is white still is white <laughs> doesn't change but what 30 odd years ago mm. um it would have been a hard thing for her to grasp and the fact that she had to sort of make ends meet for everyone there wasn't a case where it it was sort of played into us that we you know we're struggling we don't have money it was almost a case that mum would work night shifts and two jobs and and charm and look after us and you know we'd get by that way and i remember mum used to you know go to peach treats which is basically like peach treats yes which is basically this shop for those who don't know in colchester it's not there anymore Mm. who um used to get i'm pretty sure it used to be all sell by date stuff within the last month or yes. it was already out of date and they used to sell it super cheap yeah and mum used to go there when she can afford it and buy us treats and on a friday night we used to watch wrestling wwe wwe wcw goldberg yeah um so that was our treat night yes um, um and and also like the love that mum gave to us it wasn't a case where you know sometimes i guess if you are um, from a background that are maybe struggling and you're not getting the love from the parents, sometimes you, that can almost 
um, make it a bit more bitter, but you almost sense that you're not worthy mm. of others because they've got, you know, the newest football boots or mm. um, the newest gear, um, where that was never a case for us. So I think um, mum, mum did well in, in the sense of that as well. Um, but sort of talk about how that has moulded you, because from a young age, you've always liked money. Uh, yeah, well, I've liked things. You um, like nice stuff. Yeah, I've liked nice things. I think... Um, Mum done an incredible job and, and speaking from a parent as I am now to two girls, obviously Mum Rowe being the oldest and Blake being the youngest at four and one. Both still mixed race? But yeah, they still are, yeah. yeah they still mixed good. race, yeah. Um, look more like Sham than they do. Yeah, they do. Um, yeah, I think from speaking from that perspective, you realise actually how difficult it is to bring up children on your own, even together as a partnership, it, it's hard enough. So to do that as a single parent, but then to challenge the face the challenges that we had growing up obviously she's a white mother with three black kids and one white kid and different fathers and this that and the other you know mm. you think there's a lot more to go through from a parent's point of view so to look back retrospectively now when mm. I sit in the seat of a dad and say I appreciate what mum done I appreciate it more from this perspective because looking after kids now is is hard really yeah. hard um, and teaching them you know and a good, great point that you made mum always instilled in us that we weren't less than anybody and we could do anything that we set our mind to. Mm. And I remember a lesson that stuck with me is, is, and I think why I am able to be a bit more patient with things now is because of, remember obviously when we played football when we yeah. were kids and mum used to teach us the whole build a house but build a house slowly ironically mm. that's what I do now is, is housing but build a house and build a house slowly when we're starting out with football and the keep ups mm. and she was saying to us look you might not be able to we used to do the thing where you do keep ups left foot right foot left knee right knee yeah, yeah. left shoulder right shoulder head Le back down yeah left shoulder right shoulder left knee right knee left foot right so foot so like Ronaldo 7 up, down. Or exactly like that, yeah. yeah up down 14 start button work back up and she used to just say just one bit at a time no start left foot right foot start left foot right mm. foot Start left foot, right foot, and then you master that, and then bring in left knee, right knee, and then over time it might not, you know, it might take you two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, six months, but eventually you keep practicing, and then that will come. And I think um, from a perspective of you can do it, take time. Mm. That's where I think my hunger for things has come from is the sense of look, I know that if you do work hard enough and you do stay the course, those things will come. And I think. I was thinking about this before coming on and, and I thought you'd raise the question of, of you know, you like nice things and, and mm. moving towards that. And I think I like having those things because I've earned it. Yeah. You know, and it's not like it's been given to me as I've earned it. So why wouldn't I enjoy it? Yeah. And also there is that sense where it's not like we never had those things on mm. a consistent basis when we were younger. We had very nice stuff and we had stuff that, um, you know, helped and suited our needs when we were younger. Mm -hmm. Um but I think, like you say, there's almost that gratification once you've then got it, you almost appreciate it even more because we've had those times Absolutely. where, like you said, we had you know sugar on toast and stuff like that. And from the outside looking in, people that probably know us probably didn't know that that was the case in some occasions because it was, you know, we, we didn't feel pity for ourselves. It was never a case where, you know, mum, you know, was begging for stuff. She mm. went out and, and earned everything herself. So um, big respect you know to mum for that as well. I think it's, that's a great lesson to take into business if we're going to keep this on course is, mm. is the fact of some, you know, when you go to start a business or you set up a business or, or you start as a one man band and, you know, you've done it yourself and, and I've done it and a lot of people that I know have done it. Some people mm. start with a leg up and some people start from the ground up. Mm. And I think having that, ground up for me gives you a bigger advantage mm. because you have to be more resourceful instead of relying on your resources yeah you know if you've got all the money in the, and i see the same with big companies now and the companies that we compete with that's supposed to be the big companies that that we completely outdo from being less than two years old mm. is we have to be more resourceful with what we have and be more creative and that to us is a huge advantage. You know, we haven't got 30 million pound in the bank where we can say, right, well, let's spend 10 million on an ad campaign for TV yeah. this year. Well, let's spend all of this money on this this year. We have to be more resourceful and more creative 
and start innovating. Do you think part of that as well, again, I'm going to keep sort of going back to mum, mm. but do you think a part of that, again, comes from when we were younger? I remember mum with the football boots where she always used to go and used to play for Co United Academy and stuff when you're younger. Mm. But you'd see all the boys with, you know, um, £100 preds and stuff back in the day or £90 preds back in the day. And mum always, I'll never forget, she always used to say it's what's inside of the boots, not the boots themselves. Exactly. That count. And you talking about the resources and companies having all this money, it's sort of the same principle in the mm-hmm. fact that you may have all this money, but like you're saying, if you're not resourceful, if you're not building up, you know, clientele, relationships with people, if you're not trying to think about what can we do differently to help our customers, 100%. then you're not respecting um, the business you're in as well. And I think part of that maybe comes from... A lot of that, yeah. You know, but, you know we've had to be resourceful all of our life. Yeah. And, and to work with what we have and be more creative in the things that we do and produce mm. is enabled us to do well in life, you know? And, and that is the same for business. I think... Don't get me wrong, there are obviously companies that have money and people that have money that are very good at what they do. But I think the bigger advantage is coming from having very little and saying to yourself, like, well, actually, what are we going to do with this? How do we spend these small amounts of pounds that we have in the right places to make sure that we're resonating the message out there? It's it's a huge, huge advantage. I think it just makes you a little bit more resilient as well, mm. because when things go shit and eventually in all markets they're going to sorry to swear on the podcast no, right. um, when things go bad eventually there's going to be a point where you will either have to innovate or you'll throw more money at it and traditionally big companies with money will be like oh we'll just throw more money at the problem and try and solve it or we'll advertise more we'll outdo this the people that have to be more resourceful and innovate ultimately in the long run are going to be people that end up winning because mm. they're fitting the customer needs they're not just pushing out their message and being a little bit louder they're being cuter and they're being mm. smart. Plus, they would also have had some form of having to do some innovating themselves exactly. over time. Whereas, like you say, most companies, if they've never had that, will just keep throwing money at it, throwing money at it, throwing money at it, getting the next best advertising companies to try and sell it. Whereas, like you're saying, you have to be resourceful. Um, so, yeah, that's a, that's an interesting point. I, mm. The first sort of point, I guess, that I want to jump onto in terms of um linking things from a, you can talk about this from a parent perspective but also okay. from business now how do you think um schools social media um and parents so you as a like um will have an impact or are affecting people that want to start businesses up um and also what advice would you give to people that are looking to start a business but not necessarily not clued up on social media but know how to use it as their you know advantage okay so first part of the question how is school school and social socials? media affecting yeah because yeah. um you know there lots of schools now have ipads yeah. have macs and stuff like that um, yeah well f- i mean firstly let's, let's i suppose touch on schools and the schooling system and it's hard because obviously i'm a parent to kids that will eventually go to s- big schools and colleges and maybe universities i think you need to for me you need to just understand what it is that you want to do Mm. and the schooling system for me specifically has not you know it teaches you into personal skills and it teaches you the basics of numbers and language and blah 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 but for the whole even you know parents our parents and mm. parents of their generation they, they get out of if you want to do something you want to make something of yourself you either get lucky and become a footballer <laughs> or yeah. a sports person or you go to school you get an education you go to college and you come out and you get a good job yeah and that's just not today you know it's not the society most people will go to college and university and finish off and they won't get a job in the industry that they want mm. they're in a shitload of debt and they've got to pay that money back and they end up working for people that haven't done those things a lot of the time and just actually start from a lot younger and got out to make something of yourself so I think the schooling system from how it has been is a bit archaic and does need to change um it's definitely right for some people and that right if you know if you're going to be a teacher yeah. or you're going to be a doctor or you're going to be a lawyer or you're going to be something that you need to go to university for and study specifically well then of course that is the right mm. path for you and I'm not saying don't do that but don't waste your time if you are going there and you know well actually I'm just going there for the party yeah do you, so trying to link it to business a bit more yeah what do you think um again sort of everything that you and mark your business partner mm. um have done in terms of starting a business up in terms of the groundwork up everything you every little detail you had to go through how do you think schools 
again, they can link that with social media as well. But how do you think schools can help, whether that's a case of um, having specific classes on business? And I know schools will turn around and say we have business classes, but from the foundations up. So talking about how to do a business plan, a model, yeah. sustainable with social media. What do you think schools can do in terms of building that business from the ground up? Like, What things could you say that they could implement now well, that would work? as a business model well socials are tricky because they always change and I don't think teaching that at school unless they're trained in it the teachers aren't going to be too au fait with how that works mm. but just from a perspective of particularly business and entrepreneurial stuff where if you don't want to be a doctor and you don't want to be a lawyer and you are good at something else and you are good at art and you're a painter or you're good at business and you're great with people and you want to start something up or you love cars and you want to be a mechanic and you want to set that business up just to try and hone in on what that particular student is good at mm. push those things and don't make them feel shit for the things they're not good at yeah algebra and pythagoras theorem and einstein's theory of equals mc yeah. squared i've never used so more more of a emphasis on you know and the, prob the problem is for me as well that teachers will give you a do you remember when we was at school and there was that whole long division thing in tests and they go to well, you need to learn how to do long division because you're not going to be walking around with a calculator in your pocket all the time, are you? Now you are. Now I've got a fucking calculator in my pocket all of the time. Mm. Wherever I go, I use it every single day in appointments. How do I work up central mm. this? Da -da -da -da, bang, done. You know, so things evolve and they change. And it's, um, for, I don't think it's the teachers themselves. I think it's just the whole hierarchy of, you know, and you do find that, that there is always that one good teacher in schools that hopefully you will come across that gives you the ability to be like, okay, well, don't worry about this too much. You're really good at that. For me, I remember that being Mr. Hinchcliffe at school. Hinchy. I Hinchy. I remember he gave me a A he gave in P for rugby. Yeah. Didn't play it. <laughs> <laughs> so why is he giving me an A? It's just because he likes you. Because he loved me. At the yeah. time, I, you know, I played for Coal United and, and, mm. and I was good at football. And, you know, mm. it was one of those things where he was like, well, you're the talentman of this year. And, yeah. You know, the PE group, you're the one. Yeah. yeah. So you're the pick, come out and show everybody how to do 100 keep ups and come out and, you know, yeah, yeah. you know all that sort of stuff. So he just aid me across the board, but he really pushed me into the sense of, look, you're, you're going to you're gonna be a footballer, you're going to do this, mm. you're going to do that. And it instilled that confidence in me, maybe somewhat naively at the time, that this is going to be my life. Yeah. But it gave you the sense of you can do something and work at that. Yeah. He didn't really fuss me on. He's like, no, you've got to get through the theory. You've got to do this. You know, you've got to yeah. do those things. But get close enough and we'll pass you. You know, and it yeah. was that sort of be focused on the things that you're really, really good at. And don't worry too much about the stuff that you're not good at. Because ultimately, the things that you're good at, if you push them enough, they're going to be the things that will help you win further down the line. Yeah, there's pros and cons to that, isn't there? You obviously need to, you need to do the stuff that you're not necessarily as good at. Yes. But if you can find um, the time to do something every now and again, then obviously you're going to eventually get better, whether mm. that's a slow process or a quicker process, depending on how much you learn. Um, sort of, I wanted to talk about now, obviously you and your partner, so you and Mark yes. um, started up Harris Health and Mind Estate Agency. Harris Health and Mind? Harris Health and Mind. <laughs> Harris and Wood. It's too, quick. it's too close, isn't it? Harris Health and Mind, Harris yeah. and Wood. So, um, you and Mark started Harrison Wood Estate Agency. Been yes. going how many years now? Less than two. It'll be two on two. the eighteenth of May this year. So nearly, and almost, almost two. Yeah. And you're growing and growing and growing. Yeah. How many staff did you start off with? I uh, started with me, Mark, and Marcus in the office. So yep. we took Marcus from the previous company I was at, um, and willingly or willingly, yeah. yeah. Nice. Well, somewhat reluctantly, actually. We. I always knew he was really, really good and, and could see that in him. But when we first approached him, he was... And he's young. He's 21 now. So two years ago, he's probably 19, maybe 20. It's not quite two years. But I think he was 19. Um, and at that time, he was reluctant to come over and he just found mm. his job. He was working at Greg's before and now he's wearing a suit and into agency and at a big company. And it was a risk for him to come over because he obviously didn't know Mark and only knew me. Mm. So he really he was coming over to work for well, I say for with me and mm. and trusted me enough to make sure that he was looked after further down the line. So yeah, it started with us free. Um and we didn't have lettings and there wasn't the mortgage business and stuff there, which is there now. Um so it went from free to I think there's fourteen people in that office now, including yeah. Robbie obviously who does the who does the marketing side of things for us. Mm. Um 
in the space of yeah what 18 months maybe decent so just talk about the hurdles that you faced so starting everything mm. up um hurdles along the way that you overcame so by again um client relationships having a relationship with people that maybe aided you to get over that hurdle because you had a good relationship with people um and yeah sort of the advice you'd give on the hurdles that you're probably going to face when you first start up um well i think probably it's, it's best to take it back to the dc days if yeah go that's on. the right review yeah go on. um and the dead cloud days obviously when me and robbie run that there was because the reason I say that is because I've learned a lot of lessons from those mistakes that we've took into this business, which has helped me make less mistakes. Um, yeah. So just talk on. about Dead Cloud real quick, so the guys that, and girls that are listening don't really know. Yeah, so obviously a lot of people won't know um, Dead Cloud days because they were, I think we stopped in 2012, 2013, mm-hmm. so it's a long time ago now. Um, but me and Robbie used to run that brand, which was a pretty much everything type brand from youtube channel to clothing to music videos to you know anything sort of multimedia that we could get our hands on um and we didn't realize it was a business at the time until a little bit further down the line i think i started making videos maybe in 2006 2007 for cass cass mm. and my mc yeah leroy kamara um and it was just a bit of a hobby really in this room where we sit now uh, yeah mum got me that Mac or I might have bought it with my JJB money and went halves or something I can't remember um, and just started as a bit of a hobby and then eventually what I enjoyed doing turned into a business Robbie was at uni studying graphic design at the time and he had to come up for a logo for a t-shirt showed me the dead cloud logo in his car and that fiesta that he had you remember that yeah, orange yeah, yeah, fiesta yeah. with that sub in it mm. um, showed me his his logo and I, I looked at it and I thought that's sick mm. that can be a brand and he was like, do you like it? I was like, 100%. Yeah. Print it on a t-shirt. And then that sort of spiraled into us making videos together. Um, and then the Dead Cloud brand was born, really. Um, and cutting a long story short with that, accelerated pretty fast into we got ourselves in a position, really from the Coke and Vodka video, obviously with Andre and, and Cy, mm. um, Dreamer Clean and, and Cyrus, now part of Monster Florence, big up Monster Florence. Yeah. You're doing um, songs for Big Nasty as well, aren't you? Videos for Big Nasty. Yeah, so it started with um, it start that was really the main. The Coke and Vodka was that still on the Dead Cloud channel now on YouTube. Mm-hmm. Um, Coke and Vodka was the kickstart really into where everything spiraled, and and it's a good lesson for business because it's things like the more that you do, the more you put out, the more people see, and you can never. Steve Jobs' famous quote: "You can only connect the dots in life looking backwards. You can never do it mm. looking forwards. So, do as much as you can, and those dots will connect themselves." But we started with. Um, Andre and Alex doing that video of Coke and Vodka. Coke and Vodka went huge um, on our YouTube channel. It's still the most viewed. I mean, it's not a huge amount of views in regards to YouTube nowadays, but I think it's over like 200,000 mm. views that that got. And for a small channel that we are, or we were back then, or whatever, yeah. it's crazy. Um, and obviously testament to those boys for the art and, and the music that they put out. That video was then seen by Griminal, mm. an MC, yeah. um, part of Nasty Crew and... and whose brother actually lives here now. Um, and Griminal then asked us to come along and shoot some stuff with him at Lovebox Festival. Yeah. Um, and we were like, yeah, of course. Like, we'll do it for free. Blah, blah, blah. Um, so we went to Lovebox. We got AAA access all areas at the back. And then in there, we bumped into a few different people and a lot of cameos. It was very smart. Robbie shot the video in the way that when we was at access all areas, we featured a lot of different artists. Yeah. So by the time we come to put it out, all of those artists would want to see themselves as people always do. They want to see what people have put out about themselves. And then we bumped into Jamal Edwards who yeah. runs and still does run SBTV, which was at the time, I think the biggest youth broadcaster in the country on YouTube. Now brought out by Richard Branson and Virgin. I believe so. Yeah. I believe. Yeah. Uh, don't quote me on that, but he had a good relationship with Richard Branson. I remember mm. him telling me a few stories at the time when, when we used to hang about with him. Um, and we bumped into him and, Within, I think, the day, the love box was either on the Friday or the Saturday. and But the next day, before the morning to come, we had edited the video, shot the video, and got it out. And we were the first. And there was a release saying, Dead Cloud Channel, first to release footage of Lovebox Festival. And the video, Testament to Robbie, was shot and edited so well that Jamal picked it up. I got a tweet at the time, I think, where he DM'd me on Twitter and said, um, 
love the video. I want to work with you boys. Sent it to Robbie and I was like, Jamal's message and Robbie was fucking ah! yeah. at the time. Um, Cause it's a big deal. Um, and then anyway, we went to meet him at his flat and he's like, oh, I have a few bits coming up. And there was all of this talk. And at the time we didn't understand business. He'd been running it a long time. And he was like, look, I can get you a sponsorship deal with Adidas. We can get you 50,000 pound investment and you boys can really kick off and blah, 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 blah. And he was like, I want it to be under the SBTV channel. And at the time, I was a bit like, nah, man, like we're a brand ourselves. Like Dead Cloud is, is at the time, we'd grown it to a point where we got a big following or a, not big following, but a big enough following to mm. sustain it for ourselves and, and wanted to stay true to what we was doing. Um, and I was a bit against that idea and just said, look, we want to put stuff out by ourselves. And I was like, well, look, okay, for the first bit that you put out, maybe we'll put it under you guys and the next one we'll do under SB and see how we go. And we'll send you a few big jobs. Um, and then, yeah, we landed... Um, Big Nasty. Actually, I think Big Nasty was after the first call. So it was really exciting, actually. We, the, the first call that we got is like, when we get the next big thing, I'll give you boys a call. And if you deliver, then we'll carry on and we'll go forward from there. Mm. And I was like, okay, cool. So give us a shout when you got coming. He's got a lot of artists in the pipeline, a lot of stuff coming up. Um, and then I was like, okay, cool. So we left. And then I remember probably a week, two weeks later, it was a Sunday morning, uh, brunch time, uh, late morning, early afternoon. And I got a call from him. Um, Phone rang, Jamal Edwards, and I was like, I've got to get this. Mm. I was like, yo, man, I'm trying to play cool. How are you? And he's like, yeah, yeah, good. I've got a video that you guys are going to need to do. Um, but you leave, it was either the next day or the day after, in like a few days' time, um, and you've got to fly to LA. You're filming with Talisa, mm. and you need to capture pretty much everything and turn it into a music video for this new song that she's got with Nines. Yeah. And I was like, Okay, yeah, yeah, we can do that. I'm like, trying to play it cool. And at the time, yeah, I think yeah, Talisa yeah. just won like FHM's most hottest woman of the year. She's on X Factor, like doing all of this stuff. Like, career was going really, really well. Um, and I was like, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, we can, I'm sure we could figure it out. Got off the phone and I was like, ah, this is crazy. Yeah. I phoned Robbie straight away and I was like, you're not going to believe it. Um, and then, long story short, we, we didn't go to LA. We flew to Ibiza um, and it was crazy. They took us on a private jet and yeah, all basically just started seeing all of these stars and then we come back and we done Wireless Festival with her and there was loads of people that we met there and artists and we were just started rubbing shoulders with the people that we wanted to rub shoulders with. Um, then we lasted the big na uh, landed a, a big nasty gig, ended up shooting a video with him and Ed Sheeran cameoed in that. And it was just one thing after another. It just kept spiraling and spiraling and spiraling and then at that stage it was more of a case of okay, we are going to make it. It's just how big are we going to go and where do we take this in a direction of? And then we were faced with the decision of, at the time, I was still working in an agency um, and we were faced with the decision of, right, we need to leave our jobs and make this work or it's we're going to have to give it up because mm. it's taking up too much of our time. There was times where we were driving to London. I was working Monday to Saturday, maybe even all week Sundays, whenever it was my Sunday, I'm driving to London of an evening around seven filming in the night as we did most of them were night shoots and mm. then driving back at two three in the morning and then getting up again at seven for work and mm. it just got to a point where it wasn't sustainable um and so we made the decision and said let's leave work both quit at the same time and handed in our notice i was on holiday at the time and then i remember mike um who's my manager at the time who now runs michael's another good business in the town um said that you know, our area director wants you to take an office and when you come back, can you speak to him? And blah. And I was like, well, I've just resigned. Obviously, I gave Mike my resignation. He knew about it, but the his boss didn't know about it at the yeah. time. And I was like, well, just give him my resignation. What do I do? And his like, Mike's advice at the time was like, well, look, come back and the idea would be, you know, for me, my advice would be you can always say yes when you sit down and have a chat with him and then you can say no later. But if you say no now and you change your mind, then you're not going to be able to mm, go, back. go back and say yes later. Um, and I was like, okay, good idea. So I come back, had the meeting with Gwyn sat down and said yeah okay i'll take it so text robbie that day and i was like look can you meet me in um what was it o'neill's or whatever it was or pat Malloy's, whatever it was at the time yeah, i think it might pat be done Malloy's or so can you meet me there in the in the garden um i just want to tell you something that's happened today got there and i was like look this is the situation try to break it down and explain it um and then he flipped he was like fuck you I can't believe that I've quit my job you said you were mm. going to quit my job we're supposed to be doing this together and I was like look the idea for me is I'll be able to sustain us we haven't got any income coming in really apart from t-shirts and bits and bobs here and there if I get this job now and the 
OTE, like on target earnings, were like 60, 70 grand a year. And at the time, I was a young man. I was like, I've never earned that sort of money. It's like mm. more than double what my mum earns. And, yeah. you know, I was blinded by the pound notes and I was chasing the cheese. And we ended up not speaking from that point and that day for probably nearly two years. Yeah. And then Dead Cloud died there and then. And the biggest lesson I learned from that to try and round it all off and come back round to the point of, of back into business is it was more me chasing the cheese and chasing the money. And it was this cheese and then that cheese and then this promotion and then eventually you hit the mousetrap. Mm. But was there also outside factors as well that came in that, that had a influence on your decision not yeah, to? Yeah, most likely. And then obviously relationships and stuff at the time and, and mm. you know outside factors all of your influence from everywhere does have an effect on you regardless whether you see it or not you know yeah. you're you are what you are surrounded with you know you're a product of your environment and most definitely at the time I was like am I making the right decision and do certain people like these decisions and do certain people not like these decisions and I don't think I made the decision for me I think I made it more for other people and money yeah and that was the wrong choice and once you start to chase that too much you lose sight of what actually things mean to you and had we continued down the path we were then if you were to just look at the trajectory of what was happening yeah the likelihood you can never guarantee but the likelihood is we would be we would have all of that stuff now you know mm. the money and the accolades and the recommendations and you know all of that stuff would have come from from continuing on the path and it taught me a good lesson into businesses to you know stay true to the things that you believe in and don't be blinded by the money or this because it's the quick wins because they soon come and they soon go. So going back to the question of mistakes, for me, that's probably the big, biggest mistake I made in business was trying to chase the pound notes instead of chasing the thing that was the right thing to do at the time. And that's always sat heavy with me because I feel, you know, I let Robbie down and we could have had a very different lifestyle now. I do believe firmly, you know, obviously everything happens for a reason. Mm. Um, and it, had I gone down that life, and maybe you wouldn't have my kids and you know I'm obviously eternally grateful for that so everything does happen for a reason but that was probably the biggest mistake I made in in business is trying to chase the money yeah but was the question sorry about startups and what you would do to do it differently pretty much everything that you could need or want to do has been done by somebody else which is obviously a blessing and a curse but you need to have an idea which is going to differentiate yourself within that particular field yeah and how do you deliver on that but First and foremost, the, the, the hurdles that you have when we set up were things like premises, you know, where do we go, how do we start, staffing, cash flow, what is it that we're needed. Um, there's a lot of hurdles to get, you know, everybody has an idea, and particularly this industry that I work in specifically, I can talk about this more acutely because I know it, a lot of people have wanted to do it that mm. I've worked with and only a few people have and only a few of those people have actually done it any good. Um, and it's hard because it's an industry that you look at and you think, well, anybody could do it and anybody could set up, but running a business and, and growing a business is, is not as easy as it looks. And there are a lot of hurdles to do. So, you know, first and foremost is, is cash flow. you know, in this industry, you need a lot of money mm. and you think, right, well, because agency sales, if you're not going to set up lettings straight away, which I didn't, cause I don't know anything about it. And Tracy runs that, but agency and sales is we get paid probably three to six months from now so have we got enough money to run for half a year plus yeah before we even get any money coming back, back in yeah you know we get a few bits of cash injection here and there from you know referrals or recommendation whatever they may be but the bulk of our money will start coming in in half a year's time so we need to run grow and sustain ourselves for all of that time without having any money coming back in. You know, you can't guarantee how much you're going to come back in because then that would depend on how well you've started. Yeah. So you have to plan as much as you can, to, particularly if it, you want to do a, a business of this scale. So we were fortunate enough to acquire investment um, that was no strings attached investment. And I know a few other people have set up where people have invested and they've owned a part of that business. Mm. Whereas the, the caveat for me specifically, and I know Mark was the same, was if we are going to get investment, we still want to own the business. You know, yeah. we still want to run it 50-50, 100% of the business is owned by us and nobody else has any other outside influence. Okay. So we were fortunate enough to, first and foremost, how are we going to start, where are we going to get the money from? And we found investors that were close to us 
um, that were happy to lend the money. And they said, look, here's a big lump sum. And we agreed that we will pay it back over X amount of time and installments. And we signed a contract to say that that is the case. Mm. And we got started, you know, and to a lot of people, the amount of investment, you know, it's a six figure investment. And the amount of people that would look at that and think, fuck, that's scary. Mm. I can't do that because now I'm indebted to that. Yeah. 50% of that is to me and I have to pay that back. 50% of that is to Mark and he has to pay that back. Whether this business works or not, we have to pay that money back. You know, that would stop a lot of people from starting. And, and you know, there's a lot of things out there that when the ideas are there, which is great, but when it comes to the practicality of, right, well, this is you, you own this, you owe this, you've got to work for this and you've got to pay that back is a is quite a scary place to be. But that's part of business and yeah. I think you know the, the the hurdles that you will face a lot of the time are internal can I do it am I good enough yeah, what it's if a lot of fails? self-doubt isn't it a lot of self-doubt also you're again sort of going back to the earlier point in terms of wanting everything now a lot of people will probably look at that investment and go right well I need to pay that back as quickly as possible mm-hmm. and then get scared whereas whereas we've say, done it another way we've done it as in we need to invest yeah so we need to hire more staff yeah. And we need to open lettings. Because then that would be an easier way for you to then pay that money back. Precisely. In the long term. And we need to build offices for Jack to come in and start his business upstairs, the We Are Mortgages brand, that will enable us to also earn from that and get him started off the ground. Mm. You know, we need to spend out, speculate to accumulate. Yeah. Instead of, right, well, let's get as much money coming in as possible, pay that back, you know, and then all the business are, and we can do whatever we want from there build the foundations first and even now you know we still empl- we're employing more people jack's just employed somebody new last week mm. you know mark and i are now including lettings you got tracy connor kim mark me marcus ben charlie nicola taylor nikki kemp nikki mac it's 10 members of staff that are under our mm. particular name and then robbie's in there and then jack's got his staff of him mm. and two other people. So there's 14 people in that office. And we are responsible for those people yeah. as well as our business. They come into our place of work every day and we've got to make sure that they're able to pay their bills and their mortgages and eat and mm. survive and help us and help themselves. You know, we need yeah. to, it's not just the sense of well, how much money can we make from selling houses, it's how can we make sure that these people are served first and foremost that yeah. they're happy and everything can run smooth and we're doing things under the right circumstances you know so so in essence try and just elaborate a little bit more on how you you said that you need to invest in yourself by mm-hmm. hiring more staff and stuff like that most people when they're starting out might look at that but might that might be the fifth the tenth thing that they're even thinking about so mm. from from you having that plan or idea or how do you go from having that to then putting that in place but also how do you then how do you then get those ideas is that a case of you and mark sitting down planning stuff out or is it a case of you having mentors that Mm. that have done it themselves that are talking about ways that you guys might be able to to set up and and sort of fund yourself what's the process for people that are obviously sitting there thinking like right it might not necessarily be a state agency or mm-hmm. whatever but i don't really have like a creative brain or i don't really yeah. have a mentor and stuff yeah. like that what are the sort of advice in the ways that you can you know, help the others out read yeah read read and youtube because you have got mentors at your fingertips mm. everywhere you've got a book behind you there sitting towards the titans i've got the same book I've very taken so much from that book, it's Tim Ferriss. You should get it. Go on Amazon or your local bookstore. Probably yeah. your local bookstore. It will help local businesses a bit more. Go into Waterstones and pick it up and read it and figure out what you want to do. Back to your question of of how do you know when to invest and bring more people in. Firstly, I think that comes down to what do you want to do as a business? So let's use your business, for example, or Robbie's business. Let's use Robbie's business that he's got now to make it less personal for this. Robbie runs RJ Creative, which is mm-hmm. a one-man band technically, or Henry with yeah. him now, um, which is a one-man band. So you need to decide first and foremost, what is it you're going into business for? Yeah. Are you going into business to be a one-man band, have a nice lifestyle for yourself, earn a decent wage and never have to worry about working for anybody else? Yeah. Or are you going into business to 
grow a company that will serve you a bit further down the line and then you don't have to work in it and you can still enjoy all of those things. Obviously, the second one of those is a lot harder to do. One-man bands mm-hmm. are still very, very difficult to do, don't get me wrong, but you need to decide what it is you want to do because you're not going to have to worry about the staffing issues if you're going to be a one-man band and mm-hmm. when to employ. But if you are going to be employing people, it's timing and you need to look at where you want to be instead of short term now because you know we employed a lot of people in a short space of time where we could have just made more money in theory yeah instead of having all of these salaries we'll take two or three of those salaries away and we can earn another 100 grand a year Mm. or plus or whatever that may be but but that's short-sighted because we might earn that that particular year but then in year two when we need more people to sustain the people that we're trying to serve well then then we're panicking yeah well where are these people now we're a bit too busy and we are performing from a place of reaction instead of anticipation. Yeah. And you need to anticipate further down the road what's going to happen or where you're going to be by having a business mindset. And it's not as easy as, this is why everybody doesn't do it. You know, it's not as easy. You ask me the question of how do you become creative or how do you get to these points of ideas? It's not for everybody, mm. which is why not everybody does it. But if you are going to go into business and you do want to do that, then you need to educate yourself and find, for me, what I think is hugely important is a good business partner, mm. a good right-hand man, somebody you can stand shoulder to shoulder with that you can bounce ideas off because I don't have all the ideas. I'm more of the ideas man in this business and Mark's more of the operations man in this business. He's more like, oh, no, we can't do this. And I'm more like, fucking, let's yeah. definitely do this. But it works really, really well because he is one way and I'm another, but we're very similar in a lot yeah. of ways. Um, so you have to really look at what it is that you want to achieve and if you do want to have a company and you do want to grow a business that is of scale, whether that's four employees, two employees, 15 employees, 2,000 employees, you need to look at the road ahead instead of the road that you're on at this particular moment in time because today is today and the future is happening all the time. So mm. we need to make sure that where are we going to be in a year's time and two years' time, speculate today, spend money today. And you know, there's no better investment than the people. Yeah. that's the only reason we do as well as we do now i checked yesterday before we come out and for a business that is less than two years old bear in mind the amount of agents that work in this town we have outsold every single one of them this year to date so far mm. from an office to office perspective there's some businesses you know some people might listen to this and be like well we've got two offices and yeah. combine those offices and yeah. they've done you know if you don't combine the offices and you just do it office by office year to date we have outsold everybody else in this town mm. and that's the staff that's the people yeah that's not obviously and it's the brand of course we build that brand and we'll go into that a bit later but it's having good people is the most vital component in growing any business mm. because one shit member of staff can ruin it for everybody yeah i sort of want to touch on that now and it's yeah. a good point how do you build teams around you guys that emulate your brand and your beliefs as well first and foremost I think you have to lead from the front you have to be a good you have to be somebody that somebody wants to work for mm. and when they're working for you have to be somebody that they want to stay working for so let's use Charlie as an example who now works for us right so he worked for another company a, a independent who started a year and a half before us ish I can't remember um, and he was desperately unhappy there and didn't want to stay. There was no, you know, with this, on paper, we looked like a very similar company, mm. both small independents owned by two guys, set up roughly around the same sort of time. But we were the company that people look at and want to go and work towards because of A, the people that we are, and B, the things that we do. And I had good, it was yesterday, actually, I was on the phone to somebody I know called Darren, um, who works for a company that we now refer, they refer new build business to us and we help them sell it. And the feedback he gave me was, these guys are such hard workers. Mm. And I was like, yeah, you know, that is everybody. That's business. You have to fucking work hard. And he was like, but do you know what I really loved about it? Is they, Charlie and Marcus both went to see some new builds, um, a site that we're selling. And he said, you know what I love the most about it is they want to do it because they feel appreciated. Mm. And they do. You know, and we make sure that that is what we do for the people that work for us is that we make sure that they feel appreciated. Yeah, It's a relationship. It's the same as your relationship romantically or in business. You know, We always make sure that the people that work for us, first and foremost, they work with us. Mm. Where, does, where does that stem from though? Because 
most places not necessarily just in you know in your line of work but just in everything we've all worked for bosses before yeah. that have been idiots we've all worked for bosses before that you know a job's worth and they love their job and hate the staff and treat the staff like crap how where does that come for from for you guys at the top to sort of push that down to the guys at the bottom to make them feel appreciated so they're in turn actually going to want to turn up to work want to yep. work harder for you guys want to progress themselves on whereas most people will just turn up get the paycheck go moan about the manager or whatever when they go home yep. or and just repeat the cycle how where does that come from um consciously from even if it's just you or you and mark obviously there's some form of you two together yeah saying right this is how we've got to run our business to make it a success where does that come from the way that we look at it mark and i is who would we want to work for mm. how would we want to be managed how would we want to be treated really that's as simple as it is yeah if you're gonna i say it to the guys all the time if you're going to come to this office and help me and Mark build our dream, because that's what you're doing. Mm. We had an idea. You're now here to help us push that idea into existence. If you're going to come here and work with us to build our dream, I'm going to give you 110% back because mm. that's the right thing to do. You know, And how would I want to be treated at work? And it comes from the experience of working for shit people, yeah. you know, working for managers that you have no respect for or you have no common ground with or you can't have an open conversation with and I just think to myself would I want to work for somebody like that no I would not does that get the best out of me no it doesn't well then what does and who do I want to work for and you have to be those people yeah you know and it's, it, there's small things that you can do for for staff and to make them feel appreciated very very small things that either don't cost a lot of money or just our time similar to what we do with with customers but you know, with, with staff, we try and do it as much as we can. So, you know, Marcus went on holiday last week to New York, and before that, he was complaining about not having any money, and it's, oh, it's not really the right time for me to go, and I can't really afford it, and mm. you know, and didn't say it to us, was just saying it generally in the office. Yeah. And you know, Mark and I went out, and we were like, "Well, he's going away. He worked hard. He was here from day one, and then we just got him some dollars." Yeah, and come back and said, "Enjoy your holiday. Don't worry about money too much." And you know, here's some dollars and spend out and enjoy yourself whilst you're out there. Mm. Massively appreciate it. So it could be on a smaller scale. Ben, yeah. for example, loves the gym, really getting into his fitness. And you need to understand your staff and what ticks for them and what makes them who they are. You need to take time out to really look so at the people that work It's investing in the person that, exactly. or the people that are around you as opposed to just investing in the surrounding exactly. and the, the long-term vision in terms yeah. of the, the dollar. Who are they and what makes them tick? Because mm. some people are very money-driven. Some people are very title driven. Yeah. Some people are very experience driven. What's it feel like when I come here? Or how much money am I making? Or what title do I have? You know, some yeah. people have their different vices. But it's small things that can Ben, perfect examples I was just going on to, got approached by another company to go and work for them a couple of weeks ago, told us straight away and was like, I'd never leave like you guys are family. And you know, he's really bought into mm. what we do. Text me all the time. I love you, brother. You know, it's like a family yeah, yeah. relationship. And they come from small things of helping him out over the course he lost he loves the gym as i was just saying and he lost his headphones once in the gym and he was devastated he's like oh i can't go to the gym i can't listen to any music and uh, mm. we went out and we bought him some airpods mm. let's go back when you go back to the gym you ain't got to worry about your music problems anymore yeah. it cost us just over what 100 quid or whatever yeah. a small amount of money in business terms over the course of the year but that one small act of kindness has bought him in forever yeah and it's also a case of him letting him letting you guys know that he respects what you're doing by, again, messaging you all the time, saying, mm -hmm. love you, brother, or, or, or the respect by saying, look, someone's come in for me, I'm not going to go, whatever. And that's come from you guys taking your time out to understand and think about his needs as well and, and not just think, oh, okay, yeah, you can just do that. You should just mm. be doing this. Go out and buy some more headphones when you got your paycheck or whatever. Yeah, you guys that's, that's, gone. that's the answer for most companies, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, when you get paid, you can or treat it, yourself some more. Yeah, or just be like, ah, oh, go and buy a cheap pair. Or it's from... unfortunate, mate. Yeah. Uh, we, we've all we've all lost a couple of pairs of headphones in yeah. our life. That sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, just wanted to talk about as well um, for people that might be listening and thinking about starting up a business. That something that you're good at posing, posing. Posing. <laughs> posing to something that you love yeah. and enjoy doing what are the long term effects of the person and the business and what would you say if so 
Um, what, sorry, sorry, the question is, uh, do something that you love or do something that you're good at, is that? Yeah, so in terms of the long-term effect on the business. So yeah, okay. would, you, would you sort of say to someone, do something that you love um, to start up a business or do something that you enjoy or can you do both? Both. Yeah, mm. I think both, 100%. Because so. we hear a lot of times, don't we, from sometimes parents that turn around and say, you know, do something that you're good at. And that doesn't necessarily equate to being something that you enjoy. Um, yeah. You, you know, we, we grow up and we develop certain things that like we say with football or whatever. Mm-hmm. You might be good at that, but it may come countless of years where it's draining yeah. you've given, and you just don't like it for whatever reason, but you're good at it Great and that ma- makes you money. So in terms of the business model and the long-term effect, yeah, I just wanted to get your view on that. Great point. Yeah, because, you know, I'm not bad at painting walls when I decorate, but I fucking hate it. Mm. Like, I couldn't do that as a job. Like, yeah. you, I could go around and make money doing it, but... Hate it. Yeah, you've you've got to definitely find enjoyment. If you if you are going into business more specifically, um, that's I suppose that is a question. If you're getting into that, you have to find something that you are going to find enjoyment out of all of the time. Because when it gets tough and when it gets shit and when life happens to you and there's things outside influence that come in that mm. affect you and you're going to be on a down day and you've got to you got to pick yourself up and you're not going to want to do that unless you can find serious enjoyment in the things that you do. And that doesn't always necessarily mean you are going to love every single minute and every single aspect of the thing that you are doing specifically, but you need to find enjoy. So for me, you know, I love running the business and I love the people that are there. And I'm that's the thing that I'm good at is people. Yeah. You know, and I like interacting with people and I like being social and I like being around other people. It helps me feel alive and having all those people there and running that business is, you know, there's aspects of running that business that I can hate you know i don't want to do this but i do it because i know the greater good and the it, overall is going to be the right thing to be doing but i you have to in my opinion find something that you're doing it, that is going to fulfill you and you are enjoying not because of the paycheck that comes at the end of the month mm. because if you have a bad month or a bad six months or a bad year or whatever that may be and the money isn't quite there yeah well then you've still got to pick yourself up and do it and now i think the good thing for where we are is Mark and I have the responsibility to everybody else. And I find for me that is easier to pick myself up every day because I'm not just accountable for me, I'm accountable to them. Yeah. You know, and I have to make sure that things are running for myself and for them and their families and for everybody that is involved from a customer experience point of view as well. Yeah. You know, if, if we slip and we let standards slip and we don't do this one day and business and any form of success is the accumulation of all those little things that make you different or make you special or make you want to be used if we start to fall back on that we're not going to do it but you will start to fall back on that when you don't find that you're enjoying it anymore nobody wants to sustain the things they don't enjoy for too long no. so for most part most people want to set up a business and they obviously have the grand idea of setting that business up and they go over and over of business plans mm-hmm. and what what things may go wrong what things may arise and maybe they do, maybe they don't. But just talk about um, the family life balance for you. How do you get that balance between setting a business up? How is that, um, if anything, is taking its toll on, obviously, um, the time with the kids? Talk about that as well in terms of what people setting a business up may have to endure in terms of that balance. It depends, again, how... It's specific to, and this is a big topic at the moment, isn't it? Everybody talking about work-life balance and working mm. too much and not working hard enough and what you should be doing. You should be doing what feels right to you. Yeah. And what is, you need to, you're not going to create, if you want to build a big business, you're not going to build a big business by going to work for three hours a day and mm. then going to play football over the park with your mates and then yeah. going out on a weekend every weekend. You're not going to do it. If you want to build a big business and you want to make this, everything comes with sacrifice. And obviously you had Webby on this podcast a few weeks ago and he was talking about the sacrifice he's had to make. You know, people, if you want to do something special, mm. you have to sacrifice and you have to make that decision very early on. So I, I know that working how hard I do now doesn't allow me enough time to see the girls as much as I want to do and, and spend time with the kids as much as I want to do. But I'm not complaining about that because that's the choice that I have made. And I suppose that is the distinction between sacrifice and choice. 
I don't see it as a sacrifice because I choose to do what I do, mm. you know, and, and I enjoy doing what I do and I have to be around it a lot and feel like something else is happening and this thing is moving and progression is moving forward because otherwise I'm not fulfilled. So I think people need to understand that if you are going to do it, and you want to do it to a scale where people and everybody has that big dream, don't they? I want to make you know, I want to make a big, build a big business, mm. have a big impact, change the life of my family, have a great house for myself, and have all these nice things. And there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, there is nothing wrong with wanting to have nice things and making money. I think that there's no nobility in not fulfilling your full potential because you're doing everybody a disservice. If yeah. you can do better and perform better, well, then you should do it. You know, mm. if you can bring more into the economy and you can employ more people and you can have a bigger business, you can change the lives of people around you and you can earn more money and buy your mum a house and do all those wonderful things that you have dream of doing, then you should do it. That yeah. is your obligation to fulfill your potential. But you can't complain along the way and say, I don't get enough time for this or mm. I don't get enough time for that. And Yeah, I think time's a difficult one as well because um, especially with the kids and stuff like that, I think you know you're doing a good job as a parent if eventually down the line your child comes to you no matter what the situation is and feels comfortable at telling you something. You know 100%. you've done a good job as a parent. Now mm. that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be around all the time. We see it with you know parents that don't work and their kids don't like them for whatever reason. Yeah. It, it's getting exactly. the balance between being a good parent and that doesn't necessarily associate by the time that you spend with them. It's... Yeah what you do when you're around them, how you make them feel, how uplifting they feel when they're around you and how comfortable they are. And for me, that doesn't necessarily need to be, okay, you need to be home every single night. You, you can need do to that be home. an hour a day. Yeah, you need to be home at the weekend. Mm -hmm. um, I can't remember the guy's name. It's a good guy um, on Tim Ferriss' podcast, actually, that was talking about his relationship with his kids. And he says, I never take a watch out with me. I don't take my phone out with me. When I go to the park with my kids, I just let them play. Whenever they want to go home, we go home. They want to go home in 20 minutes, go home in 20 minutes. Yeah. They want to go home after whatever, we just do whatever they want to do. There's no restrictions. And I thought that was quite interesting because a lot of things now are, are like play dates or they're sort of supervised or they're like, right, we're going here today, we're doing this. Whereas giving that child the freedom and the understanding of, from the child's perspective that mum or dad's going to be there the whole duration yeah there's no right we're here for 20 minutes and then we're going it's that freedom i mm. think that was quite interesting um but yeah i think like you're saying you've got to find that balance that works for you and then not complaining obviously, find the balance that, that works choice. for you and obviously make sure that the people that are around you are happy you know mm. and it's relationships like you say that people feel comfortable enough to your kids should feel comfortable enough to come to you and tell you anything and talk to you mm. that should be how you run your business yeah. people should be comfortable enough to come to you and talk to you and you should love them like you love your children and your family but you yeah, know 100 and, and the difficulty is and particularly from partners and i know that there'll be a lot of people women and men who run businesses where their partners don't quite understand that the business if you, particularly if you have kids is another child Hmm. Your business is your second, third, fourth baby and you have to grow it and you have to nurture it and you have to love it and you have to spend time there and it, it is another member of the family. You have to take it just as serious hmm. as that. But not only that, you've got such big extended family, you've got all the responsibility to those people who work in it and use your services as well. Yeah, um, it, it, is, it takes up a huge amount of your time and you have to be willing to, yeah. to accept to, that. To sort of summarise, what would you say the main key factors of setting a business up are in regards to how to get it off the ground and how to get it off the ground oh yeah so we didn't cover over the branding and the social side of things yep. and stuff as well did we which will probably be a, you know you, you need you need first and foremost you need to have a good idea or something in the market that there is going to be a need for Mm -hmm. You know, I think some people look at business and they try and you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You haven't got to be like, oh, this is the next big thing. You, you can do something that is already there, but just do it better. And that's how we look at our business. We, we're not the first estate agent to open a gold star. And knowing that people will invest in you, not necessarily, right, I have to create something that people are going to invest in. If but they invest in you. Once you've there. proved yourself, you know, nobody will know who you are when you start. Yeah. And rightfully so. You have to come to the market with something better. You have to come to the market with something different. You have to come mm. to the market with an idea and a service that is going to outdo your competition because why else would anybody use you? Mm. 
you know you haven't got to reinvent the wheel you just have to be better at delivering on what people are doing and understand that that's going to take time for people to appreciate because we can i firmly believe we are the best agency in this town in regards to the experience and the consistency and what people do and feel and get when they use us but they only do and feel and get those things when they use us when they use us mm. so it's how do you get to those people in the first place and i think people at the minute when they're looking at starting a business is where do i start what do i do how do i build a following how do i get my name out there yeah 110 percent that is socials yeah depending on your business facebook instagram linkedin and again, that'll be linking back to going on things like YouTube and figuring out how to use those ways and the tools, especially if you don't have people in marketing and advertising. You, you but you need to figure that to. out. You need to figure out how to market and advertise. Mm. The problem is old ways, and there are still a lot of that in the market now, old ways do not work. Playing it safe is the unsafest way to play it now. You have to come to the market without playing it safe and make sure that your message is getting out there and not being swallowed up because everything is done. Mm. If you keep spending the same message as everybody else, for example, we put a build or billboard up. You've seen the billboard, yeah? yeah? Which is under North Station, so a super busy part of the town where most traffic will come through. People commute back and forth to London all the time. You can't really miss it if you live in the town. And on that billboard message, and other agents have done billboards. Yeah. Big, our big competition in the town do billboards, and they have done billboards. Do and on roundabout signs. On roundabouts and, like and yeah. signs, and they're boring. Mm. It's white noise. There's a word for it in advertising. I can't remember what it's called. I think it's... it's ad, I can't remember. Robbie will be able to tell you. Ad blindness or ad... Something like that. Basically, but where you can you keep seeing an advert, it doesn't but register. you see it so much, you don't yeah. even notice it anymore. It doesn't resonate with you. Or same mm. as radio. You hear it, but you don't hear it because... Mm. You hear it so often, it's doing nothing for you. So we come to an idea of saying, right, well, look, obviously, so, I'll go back to socials in a minute, but we were like, well, look, we want to put a big message out there because obviously we've got a great social following, but there are still people in different demographics that may not follow us or may not have found us there, and we still want to reach them and we still want to make sure they're aware of our brand. Hmm. And we said, well, let's put a billboard up. I was like, okay, where are we going to do it? Found the spot. And then a week later, you know, I'm a big believer in the law of attraction and, and creating your own destiny. And a, a week later, somebody emailed me about ad spots for billboards. Mm. Perfect Weirdly, time. perfect time. And it wasn't where we wanted it to be. But I was like, oh, we were just talking about this. So maybe we can ask them if they've got anything else coming up around here. And all of a sudden, the perfect spot come up. And that's Apple exactly where we want convos, bro. It. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. It's, Alexa as well. Yeah. Yeah, all these new technologies. Um and it wasn't where we wanted to be, but we've eventually got the spot where we wanted it. And the billboard went up and Robbie and I sat down and said, look, we need to come up with something that, you should, some of the ideas he had. So we need to come up with something that is going to, and I've always been a big fan of Richard Branson and, mm. and how Virgin market themselves. And they're very sort of left wing and a bit out there and a little bit more, you know, less be a bit dangerous just with a bit it bolder yeah yeah just a bit more brash and not play it safe understands that playing it safe in business you will lose and we sat down and we said right we need to come up with something that's not first of all not going to offend anybody but it's going to get the attention of people in the right ways mm. and we we're throwing around some ideas and robbie had some mad ideas which sparked the idea that i had and and his idea was well let's put something up that is a bit tongue-in-cheek and a little bit like he's like let's sex sales let's mm. put something up that's a little bit sexy but that's a little bit tongue-in-cheek i was like what sort of ideas you got first idea we had was <laughs> um have a look at these beef curtains <laughs> and then we could have a picture beef of curtains, curtains on because oh it relates back God. to property i was like rob there is no way we are putting yeah, up an advert poor, that says beef curtains ridiculous so anyway the, the advert we ended up putting up was just a quotation saying that said nothing gets me more excited than a lovely semi perfect Perfect. Big tongue in cheek. It doesn't offend anybody. If you are offended by that, well, then that's your own fault. That's your own problem. You know, you've probably got so. But it got attention mm. in the right ways. The amount of traction that that created on social and, and the following grew ridiculously. People thought that we were human. Mm. The brand language was right. It wasn't stiff. It wasn't about us. It wasn't call us for your valuation. We can do this for you. Top selling agent in the town. We can do that for you. It wasn't about us. It was more just the 
marketing thing that went out to just say we're human we're fun we're here to help yeah and it was amazing but the amount of love i got for that was unbelievable and you talk to other businesses and the amount of hate that other businesses give you for it yeah and i heard that even you know people close to me that are supposed to be your friends and ambassadors were a bit like mm, you know i don't know that's no, not the right not very professional mm. other businesses saying you know well if anybody with kids see that then and that's not going to sit well with them and it's just hate and yeah. jealousy and a sure way From- to lose but you have to if you are going to be doing things you have to make a noise in a way that you aren't going to please everybody and you aren't going to play it safe because you will win from those things and that has done nothing but good for our business not yeah well, it's facts around. anywhere that you're not going to please anyone with anything you do so that's that's just factual from that ad that you put up mm. what business if any did you get loads yeah loads did you get people coming in saying we've, we've never seen you before we saw the ad yeah. and we saw your ad. We got people message. If I showed you my LinkedIn now, it's ridiculous. Hmm. We got people messaging me all over LinkedIn. Saw the advert, incredible. Other agents saw the advert. Don't tell my manager I've messaged you, but fucking yeah. hell, that was incredible. Everybody really, like, everybody loved. It. You can't not. Hmm. It's a clever bit of advertising. Robbie and and advertising world call it like you know, a smile in the mind. Like when you see it and you think, ah, yeah. you know. And it, it, you can't not. And we had people. You know, I had people say. It captures like drove the childish your, imagination. It does. Though, as well, doesn't it? How people say, drove past your board, loved it, started laughing my head off, went on your Facebook, saw that you're advertising this property, so I've called up to view it. Hmm. You know, that were people we would never would have reached before. Yeah. And the people that drove us back to where we were because we were brave enough to do something that wasn't the status quo and the same as what everybody else is doing. Yeah. Because everybody's done it. You'll get drowned out and it's a waste of our money. That cost us a lot of money to do it, and we would have wasted our pound notes mm. by putting up a call us for a free valuation, or number one agent in this. No one gives a fuck yeah. where you sit. No, of people course. care about who you are, the experience you're going to deliver, again, and what you offer. Yeah, again, it's a personal experience, isn't it? If they know, if they've seen some form of advertising that seems it's tongue in cheek, you know, they from a personal perspective, they know that there'll be someone in the office at least that they will be able to you know come to and be like look you're you're selling my house or you're selling these properties for me we're willing to work with you because you've yeah. got a bit of a sense of humor not bit someone who's like yeah mate we're going to sell your house we've been the top agents for the last five years the same spill that everyone else is you know what i mean and it's just like it's very monetized and it's very very yeah and it's very very um dull and people nine times out of ten don't even end up recommending those people no. that they use because there's no standout the mm. problem is there's no authenticity and you have to be yourself and wear it warts and all in business mm. great metaphor right so mm. the end of eight mile in that rap battle with eminem and papa doc or whatever his name <laughs> is you know where eminem goes in at himself he's like i am white i am a fucking bomb i do and at the end of that rap battle he's like now say something mm. and papa doc's sitting there like fuck got nothing to say. i've got nothing to say because you wear it like if, if you are going to go into business and be completely 110 percent yourself mm. no one can say anything about you no no one can oh well they're liars on this or they do this you know they, no one can say it i know who i am i know what we're about and we're going to deliver on those messages yeah we might not have it perfect or yeah we might not be this or yeah we might be a bit too tongue-in-cheek or yeah we might be a little bit more that way than stiff corporate way that everybody expects it to be but that's who we are if you want to work with us yeah, we will deliver for you and if you don't because we're not for you well then fine you know there's plenty of other agents out mm. there that you can go and find but eventually we'll be the people that people remember instead of hi we're number one yeah and, and I think as well us. like the like the the thing for me the take point for that is our next door neighbours had a house up for sale and we didn't even know they were, they were putting a house up for sale and it was with, uh, Charlotte ended up looking on Right Move, I think it was, and it was with a different brand, a different company, and then um, found out that you guys were then there, and then when I started okay. speaking to my next door neighbours, they were like, yeah, we couldn't, you know, uh, we use this estate agency, and they yes. weren't really selling anything for us, and they, they were just put, like selling us pipe dreams, and it was going on for months on end, and I remember you guys going in, and she was talking about how well that everyone you know, how nice everyone was, how personal everyone was and how honest. And, you know, for me as well, obviously knowing you as someone who's been in my life all these years, knowing you taking that into your business as well and the staff that 
are taking that message on board is is such a good thing to see especially for some people close to you like your neighbors you know you don't want it oh yeah that's yeah. my brother oh yeah they're yeah they're coming <laughs> yeah, they're, you know, yeah. they're snakes or they try promising us this so it's good it's good that you guys are carrying that message across mate and do you know what i think a lot of that comes from you, you when i go out which i do most of this side of the job as in putting properties on the market i i we keep the promises that we make mm. and to ourselves that's why i've got so much confidence in our business because previous companies i've worked for you go out people you tell people this is the service they're going to get and they don't get it mm. always yeah so we've got a system in place whereby it's so well oiled that when we promise we're going to do something or cause it, it always happens. Yeah. Because of the systems and the processes that are already in place that are set up from the start because we knew what didn't work from previous. But the confidence that I have in the business comes from keeping the promises that we make to ourselves and to the customers. Yeah, for sure. If I say I'm going to do something, then I'll do it. Mm. And if I say that they're going to get this type of service, they will have it, which is why you go on our Facebook now and look at all of the reviews. Every single one of them since we've opened is five star out of five. Mm. Every single one. Because when we say we're going to do something, we do it. Yeah. When other businesses, pretty much all businesses in this town, say they're going to do something, they will not do it. Yeah. Or they won't consistently do it unless things happen quickly. Or you have to then go back and say, look, you promised me this. This doesn't happen. And then they then go, okay, yeah, we did. We'll do it. Yeah. Just, um, just wanted to ask you a couple of things. How do you think businesses will evolve in the next five to ten years? Great question. Um, for me, I think we will see, first and foremost, I think we will see how the ratio of women and men in business operate. I think we're going into an era now where there are going to be a lot more women CEOs and head of companies than there will be men. Because the reason I say that is because I understand from running the business I do now, when you've got 14 people in that office, business is a lot more today about EQ and emotional intelligence than it is marketing and branding and advertising because ultimately what that comes down to as I said earlier is the people when you've attracted the people to come and use you or buy from you or whatever that may be hmm. it's the experience they have when they're there and yeah. they only have a good experience when people are having a good experience working for you and when you look at I could probably tell you now if you pointed anybody out in the office today if I leave here and look at my phone there'll probably be 10 different fires you've got to put out or this person's had this thing go wrong and every single person in that office has either something going wrong personally with their health mm. or some form of issue that could affect their business if they allowed it to and what I noticed from you know parents in particular look at women and they're normally the most caregivers when it comes to children mm. because they have an innate empathy for other people and how they feel is important they're just more loving yeah. you know men are we're brought up to be a little bit more hard-nosed and sort it out and you don't bring your problems to work and yeah if you've got something you know you leave it at the door when you're coming in and you know you sort of you know we're not like that it's mm. a case of if there's issues let's go and sit and have a coffee and that's more important let's try and figure that out first and foremost because if you're not happy it's going to affect everything else moving forward of course so i think we'll see a big change because women are just in my opinion naturally better at looking after people than men and particularly like men with old school ideologies of toughen up stiff up a little yeah you know, you eventually we will see the more successful businesses being run by women because they know how to look after people and that's what's going to help grow mm. them down the line and attract better people to come and work for them in the first place somebody wants to work for dickhead down the road or do they going to want to go and work for where they're going to get treated well and looked after and and a lot of people would choose that over any form of money and any form of title. Mm. I would rather be happier at work than work for somebody who I think you're a fucking knob, but I'm a slave to this ship because you pay my mortgage. Mm. Don't put yourself in that sort of position. So I think, yeah, that would change. The landscape of business in regards to how things work and operate is definitely more customer experience now than it is this is what I've got. Because before it was a case of sell people this product and then you can continue to sell it once you've got a vast majority and you found that tipping point. Now it's more experience because there's so much of what you're selling. Do you think that's going to be more on a, um, a personal basis? So face to face, or do you think a lot of it now is going to become in the next five to ten years online? 
depending on your industry, I think there's both, but definitely online space and e-commerce and how things are done is going to be way more online. Um, but there's definitely a room for both. The industry that I work in, I think a lot of people say, you know, are you worried about the online agents? And mm. no, I'm not at all because the experience that we create, I think is far superior than any experience you can get anywhere else. And it's front end as well as back end and pushing that yeah. through. Um, but online space is to definitely be worried about if you're a business that isn't offering good enough. You see it all the time. Yeah. The high streets and retail and how things are collapsing. You see it every single day. But that's not because of online. And I said this to the guys when we set up. The reason that we do so well and the reason that we did so well to start from day one to where we are now is because it's less about, and whilst it's important, it's less about what we do and more about what other people aren't doing. Mm. That's an enabling us to fill those gaps. And people rest on their laurels. They start to have really good ideas mm. and they don't follow through with them. Yeah, you know, We have way different experience of the people that come to us. Like everybody gets a, well, it used to be a bag, but now it's a box. We just made these, designed these boxes, which are literally like this big and tied them up and it's ribboned and there's paper in there and it branded up with us. And when you buy and you come in or you sell when you come in, when you're given the keys or when you come in for a thank you, we give you that box and inside that box is a surprise, whatever that may be, whether that's a bottle of chocolates and champagne and a mug or your keys or a thank you and a trip to the movies or whatever that may be. Mm. It comes in that box. It's all branded up and it's part of the experience. Yeah. And experience is massively, massively important. E And particularly more so in online business and a lot of people thinking of going down that space and the e-commerce business, which makes sense to build a business online. You have to provide an experience. Yeah. And then that Tools of Titans book that you read there, I got a really good idea from a, a book. Um, one of the guys who runs a company, I can't remember what it was called. And it, it was about sending out the right emails and just small tweaks that make a big difference. Mm. And that's a massive, I'll try and find it for you whilst I'm talking to you. And that's one of those things. It's a really, really small thing. And it, it, it seems massively delicate in the sense of, well, actually, does that make a big difference to people? But we send out, a letter when everybody completes through us of to and it's a bit tongue in cheek let me see if I can find it for you and do a bit of filler whilst that's in there was there another question that you had yeah the other question oh a bit more personal to be fair afterwards it was just uh... sorry this is it to, before you dive in yeah. so we send this letter out to everybody that comes in uh, sorry that um, sells or buys for us and it sounds really trivial, but it makes such a difference. The amount of people we have that pick up on it. So it goes out, it says, congratulations, big capital letters and the smiley faces. You move in and we couldn't be happier for you. Selfishly, though, we're a little sad and that you don't need us anymore. But we understand that you've moved on to bigger and better things. We're really happy you've had a wonderful time sending with Harrison Wood. We had such a good time dealing with you. But sadly, all good things have to come to an end. But not just yet. To remember the good times for a little longer, we've put your picture up in our staff room in the finest gold frame that money can buy with a customer of the year plaque underneath. We'll take it down when we meet someone that we like more. Brackets, never. <laughs> when you come to drop off your keys on completion, we'll have a little something waiting for you to show our appreciation. And in the unlikely event that you ever get knocked on the head, lose your senses and decide to sell this marvellous property you've just purchased, then we welcome you with open arms. And until this episode should occur, we wish you the world of happiness in your new home. This isn't goodbye, rather a see you soon. And please feel free to pop in for a coffee and a chat and tell us about how you're getting on. We'd love to hear from you. We'd like to thank you from the bottom of our hearts for choosing to sell with us, buy with us. We miss you already. Shane and Mark. Small things like that, and the amount of people that come in and they say, where's my picture then? Yeah, you know, yeah, is it yeah, up yeah. in the wall? Obviously, it's not. It's a bit tongue-in-cheek, and but it's the experience that people have when they're selling with you or yeah, buying with you or dealing with your service that makes them think, I'm going to remember those guys, and I'm going to come back. Mm. Small things, but they make a big difference. Decent. When I get a bit personal now, sure. ask a few different types of questions. What's the single-handed toughest challenge you've faced in your life so far and why? Single-handed toughest challenge? Um, good question. Um, lots of challenges, really. I think what was more character building was probably going back to when I was younger and you spoke about it previously on a podcast you did was the rejection of football. Mm. And that taught me a lot about rejection and I think probably started the fire of thinking I don't want to be in anybody else's or under anybody else's control. 
mm. and I want to dictate my own destiny and eventually I want to do things for myself when we were younger teenage years got dropped from Col United when you expect to be like right, a few years time or a couple of years time I'm going to be going on to scholarships and youth team and this and that and you mm. know we're talking contracts and we're talking I'm going to be a professional footballer yeah and then you get a call one morning to say right sorry Lisa but we no longer need your son and it's that's a tough thing to deal with when you're a kid when you're a teenager and all you've known is football and all you've ever thought you'd do and all your teachers at school then yeah you know he's going to be a football and this and that mm. and you have to learn to be resilient in the face of rejection and you get it every day that's why I love business so much is you get rejected and you get those knockbacks and I'm used to it which is why it doesn't affect me as much as it did anymore because I'm used to that whole well I know that it's a mistake first and foremost for you to not do it not from an arrogant point of view but just from a point of view of I know what we do and I know what the others don't do mm. so you can reject me today but unless it doesn't work unless it works quickly you're going to be coming back to us because I know we're good enough for it yeah but that was tough that was to deal with that at such a young age but I'm glad that it did happen then because it teaches you a lot more resilience and perseverance and understanding that actually sometimes things aren't going to go your way and there are going to be setbacks and there are going to be things that you have to deal with that are just part of life what what would you say you took away from that that you've used as a positive in your life now to understand that it's going to happen mm. you know instead of i think a lot of people are wrapped up and and you know the society now i think webby was talking about it on your but maybe not but you're getting medals for doing the sports race and finishing 10th. Yeah. And, you know, don't worry. As long as you... A lot of muddly cuddling. Yeah, molly cuddling. As long as you try, that's all that matters. And, you know, it's not the winning, it's the taking part. In business, it's fucking winning. If you don't win, mm. no one's going to pay you for taking part. No one's going to... You know, th there's no... if oh, well, you didn't win this day. Well, we're still going to give you the money and we're still going to keep your lights on and we're still going to pay your rent and we're still going to pay your wages. You have to perform mm. and you have to make sure that what you're doing is better and what you're doing is going to sustain. There's no, you're going to get a pat on the back for not doing the job. That's the beauty of running business. That's the blessing and curse of running a business. If you win, you win. And if you don't and you lose, well, then you deserve to lose. I had this conversation with, a dear friend of mine who runs another agency business a little while ago in the town and similar businesses. And he was saying to me, well, you know, the, the, well, let's not look, tout each other's stock and let's not do this. And that was fine to start with. And the mm. agreement was there and, you know, that was fine. Um, and then it got to a point where the water was getting muddied invariably as it always is going to do. And this person says that and their side saying this and our side saying that. And I was just like, look, let's just call it a day and, Mm. let's leave this agreement because it's just making our friendship worse and the response was well you know I take it personally and if it's going to be a case that we're going to do that it's going to ruin our friendship and I was thinking well, why is it going to ruin our friendship mm. if you lose and I win surely first and foremost you'd rather I win than anybody else win because mm, we're know. friends and if you lose you deserve to lose and then it's Same also, as me. If but, I lose yeah. and you get business from me because we weren't good enough or we didn't do the job or we didn't deliver on what we said we we're going to do, well, then you deserve it because we did not do the things that we said we we're going to do. We deserve mm. to lose. But that, well, yeah. Also, there's a, there, there isn't that reflection there from that individual to turn around and be like, right, why did we lose? Or, or why did I lose? Um, obviously, you guys ended up winning. What can I do to then improve? so that precisely the next time exactly. this may happen we come out on top exactly. and then you congratulate because obviously you're friends you congratulate each other and be like well, well, well done, done. Da, 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 da. next then time you we'll need get to, yeah, you yeah. Step, you step, you, your game up because that is business step but your game up that's life that's people step clearly don't want to focus on that so and we lose every day point. I lose every day I go out to appointments are you going to put your house in the market are you going to put your house in the market fortunately I win a mm. lot more than I lose but the ones that I lose I phone them and I say thank you for your time can mm. you just tell me what it was that i didn't do right or that they did better than me yeah to help me fine tune next time moving forward so i don't lose again mm. and then i'd say congratulations to that agent i yeah. don't slag them off i don't say they're shit why have you made that decision or this mm. you know you're gonna get more you know this is a wrong choice 
it's not very becoming first and foremost no and I think that's a way to try and progress as an you individual got, isn't it in life you're going to lose you've got to deal with them losses in terms of uh, advice what advice would you give your children regarding sacrifice making mistakes and regret and also how would you apply it to yourself now if you Ooh, currently aren't good question uh, the advice I would give to my kids is make sure that you're doing the things that make you happy um, and be kind Mm. Great saying by Henry Henry James. There are three. I won't do it word for word, but it's similar to that. There are three things that are important in in human life. The first is to be kind. The second is to be kind, and the third is to be kind. And that is so important. Mm. And I'm blessed with that. Obviously, Blake's a little bit younger, but Monroe is. I'm biased because obviously I'm her dad, but she's the kindest kid. Mm. She's got a she's very very kind, pure she's heart. Like... You know, she is not spiteful. She looks after other kids. She got a wow star from her preschool a little while ago that it was my proudest moment as a parent that said, Monroe has got this wow star because she's shown her other friends the right thing to do. And what she did was she was in school and there was this foreign kid that was in the class who didn't speak the language very well. And in preschool, there's no setup. Like you don't go in, sit down, do maths. It's mm. just like you go in, yeah. you fuck yeah. around. Yeah. <laughs> you just have a good time with your mates and you mm. just slide around and bounce balls. And there was this one kid that was sitting by himself because of the language barrier. And the teacher said that she went over to him and picked him up and said, come over here and play with us. Mm. And just invited him in to the group to make sure that he felt... Included. Included. Yeah. And incredibly proud. Just, you know, and, and you, if you continue along those lines in life, like, you, you will win. if you, you know, you do good things. And I didn't do very many good things when I was younger. And I've learned to do them a little bit more from, from being older. And, you know, I'm not saying I'm a saint and I've always been a lovely person. Um, but you learn as you grow up that those things are massively important, particularly more so when you have kids. So as long as they're happy and they're doing the things that make them happy, obviously you need to understand that you have to make a way for yourself in this world. You know, mm -hmm. don't rely on anybody else. Don't rely on me. Don't piggyback. You know, I'll give them everything mm. that they need. Of course I will, and I'll support them forever. But make sure you're happy and make sure that you're doing something for yourself that is fulfilling you and, and you need to go out and you need to make it happen. Um, there's going to be sacrifices, like I said earlier. But they're choices. It's less of a sacrifice and it's less hard to do when you're actually doing the thing that you really want to be doing. Mm. Most people aren't doing the I put something up on my Instagram the other day. And fortunately, it was more yeses than those. But I said, how many people love where they work? I think it was 65, 35, or whatever it was. And to the 35%, I said, well, what is it that's holding you back? And most people gave the same answer. Slave to the money. They couldn't afford to leave. Mm. Or there were slightly different circumstances, like I have to work here because it gives me a work-life balance for the kids and I need to look after them. I yeah. understand that. You know, There's going to be some certain points you have to sacrifice for a short period of time. And then you know, my response was, well... When you're going to work between nine and three whilst your kids are at school, what are you doing between seven and 12 when they're in bed? Yeah. Are you working on that thing that you want to be doing or are you just sitting down and watching TOWIE <laughs> yeah. and doing nothing else? You know, you're not doing the thing you want to be doing ultimately is a reflection of your standards and where you see yourself. If you mm. raise your standards and you decide that that's what you're going to be doing, the universe opens up for you and mm. things start to happen for you. You just have to make a decision and decide. There are going to be things that you don't want to be doing. Like you said earlier, there's sometimes going back to school and you know, there's going to be stuff you need to do mm. because you have to do it. You swallow that. But then when you've got time that you can be doing things more productive, don't waste it by doing shit. Waste it by doing stuff that you actually want to be working on. Yeah. I think mean, it's coming out of habits, isn't it? Like you're saying, getting in, sorting the kids out, mm. making dinner or whatever, spending time with them. Then it's they've gone to bed. Then it's a case of, right... I'm tired. I'm tired. That's my. It's a habit they've got to obviously eventually come out of. But yeah, like you say, if you can get out of that habit and then start working on the things that you want to do, chipping away at that over time, eventually you'll get to that point where you're like, do you know what? I'll sp I'll spend more of my time doing this mm -hmm. as opposed to watching Towie or doing something unnecessary that I don't need to be doing. And same as what you do. Come. You know, mm -hmm. you do, you go to do your yeah. job and you want to do your podcast and stuff on the side, and you you have to make mm -hmm. time for that. Yeah, you could be sitting around masturbating in <laughs> bed right now if you wanted to be doing doing nothing in bed is a bit, a bit gross out sitting at home in doing bed. absolutely nothing nah, but, you know sure. you could be doing whatever you wanted to be doing sitting in front of the TV catching mm. up on your Netflix but you decided well actually if I want to start growing this side of my 
business or brand or just your personal hobby, whatever you want to be doing, well, then I need to allow for three, four hours in the morning to sit down and get this done. For sure. You know. Last question that I wanted to ask, try and dig deep and have a little think about what was the single purchase item in your life that has given you the most value and why? My iPhone. Your iPhone. 100%. Why? Because I can run my whole life from that thing right there. Mm. Whole life. I can start, and anyone can. You can start a business. You can, Jack, right, who runs We Are Mortgages, Mm -hmm. is in Thailand right now. Yeah. He FaceTimed me the other day walking down the street and was like, look at this. I was in Thailand for a bit Mm. just because I had my iPhone in my hand. An incredible bit of technology. And you can you can start from nothing and we have all those platforms on there yeah. facebook linkedin instagram snapchat twitter that are free to use mm. that you can grow an audience on if you do it in the right ways from that one piece of technology in your pocket mm. where your teacher said to you, you're never going to be walking around with a calculator in your pocket you need to learn long division yeah and oh, i fucking don't i can now <laughs> i can do and the problem is somebody had this conversation with me the other day and they were like oh well i was valuing a house and they were like oh, my kids are just sitting on their iPads. And, blah, blah, blah. and I'm like, well, good. They're going to grow up with iPads. Like, mm. what do you expect to happen? But also, if you don't want them on iPads, don't get them iPads. Yeah, but f- precisely. If you don't want them to sit there on an iPad because you have an idea that you want them to do something else, well, then fine. But when they go to school, they're going to have iPads. Mm. That's what's going to start to happen as we move forward. Technology is going to happen. Mm. Like, don't worry about Like, you have to be don't be too precious about how things were done previously and a lot of people are oh, you always on your phone you're always on well because i'm running my life from there mm. and it's an asset attention is an asset if you can build a following and you are social when you are active and you have when you come to grow a business or sell something you're at a big advantage yeah because you've already got so how would you say that's giving you value in your life because it's enabled me to start businesses and run them and mm. be happy so if the internet all crashed down and you couldn't do that? I'd figure out another way. But yeah, I mean, if, if the internet crashed down, then everybody, a lot of businesses would be fucked. Mm. Well, to be fair, Amazon's you guys the biggest still, business in the still world. still personal, would you'll still be going, won't you? Yeah, yeah and you on can. Our sale. business, fortunately, is not relying solely on the internet. Mm. And there were days where, you know, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, Rightmove didn't exist. Mm. Rightmove is obviously the biggest platform where people find property now in our country. And it didn't exist. Mm. It was coming into the agents in the town centre, picking up leaflets or looking at property in the window, open houses, post, phone. So how do you, you, you talk about you being on your phone because you obviously you're running your business and stuff from it. Yeah. How, um, how do you manage your time on your phone? I just do as much as I need to do. I don't have a filter of... I've used it too much or I've used it too little. It's just a case of, is it necessary? Well, then I'll do it, mm. you know? Then because I look after a lot of the market inside of things in the business and majority of the market inside of the business, then I need to use it. It's engagement. That's where people are. You know, people are on their phones all of the time. That's where we're going to get people's attentions and we need to understand that we need to put the stuff out that is going to resonate with those people and that comes from being on your phone a lot. You need to just understand that, you know, particularly if you are with somebody who runs a business, Mm. they're going to be on the phone tying up deals or they're going to be on the phone emailing or they're going to be checking the accounts or they're going to be advertising on Insta or they're going to be networking on Facebook or they're going to be doing something on LinkedIn. They're going to be Mm. on their phones and being active if their vision is to... Yeah, I suppose as well, there is still finding that balance between being in that present moment with the individual individuals that you're with. Oh, definitely. I'm never, to, you know, like I'm never, you know, if const- I'm constantly if I'm, watching and no, no, no. Next, if I'm out for dinner or, you know, we're here or with, I, I, I firm believe you give people your attention. Mm. You know, you don't sit there and be like, Oh, you know, there's times where I have, and this it's because it's necessary to do for a particular reason. But you know, if me and you were going to go out for dinner tonight, mm. you know, we'd sit and have a chat and we'd have some dinner. Yeah. You know, you give people your attention unless there's anything specifically, urgent kids have had an accident or shops falling down or you know something that you yeah, need to attend to right now unless it's that then 
absolutely you balance your time and you need to build those because it's just as important the relationships of the people that you're with as well as the relationship in within your business yeah for sure you know you need to build those there's other aspects of your life other than just your work that is going to fulfill you you need a good relationship with your spouse your kids your friends family mm. any other acquaintance you know business people on a different level of just can i sell you something or can i market myself to you mm. last question what's your aim moving forward personally and from a business perspective business perspective um just continue to grow we're looking to open a second office this year um ideally this year maybe early part of next year depending on well first and foremost how well this year goes and premises timing staff all that sort of stuff you know i'm a big believer in sorry 100 percent yes mm. or no um when it comes to people coming in i'm not halfway house i don't if i'm not sure then it's a no and if i'm 100 percent, then we'll do it so finding good people first and foremost is hard but we want to grow to office number two this year um have the wheels in motion by the end of this year and early part of next year and then continue to grow and move forward from there um and probably opening up more offices at this moment in time anyway that may change and we decide well actually let's go the online route because that makes a lot more sense for the business and, and try and grow more nationally that way as opposed to slowly bit by bit in each town if there's a need for it of course we'll do it and if not then we won't um, and personally just to just continue to better myself really and have better relationships with people around me you know my kids first and foremost my family, friends, you know, I, I want to just be happier in the space that I am and make a difference and help improve people's lives if I can in any form of way. Mm. Um, just be happy is ultimately the end goal. Grateful. Well summarised. Appreciate you coming on, brother. Thanks for Cheers having me. Cheers for sharing the knowledge. We'll get you on soon. Thank you very much. Appreciate Bye. it. Thanks, man. What's up, guys? Thanks for listening in. That's been another edition of the Harris Health and Wine podcast. That was Shane Harris, hopefully giving you some great insight into business. Um, if you're someone who's thinking about potentially starting up a business, um, highly recommend giving it another listen um, and sharing it with friends as well who may be also thinking about starting a business up. Um, I'd also just like to give a quick shout out to James Webb, who, if you don't follow him already on our previous podcast, spoke about um, becoming a world champion. He is now a world champion so congratulations to james webb um if you haven't seen that podcast um or listen to that podcast check it out and um, we talk about visualization and um going for everything that you focus on so highly recommend that um there'll be more podcasts to follow in the next coming weeks so stay tuned appreciate it again um share these with friends family um anyone who you think would be interested in these podcasts um the goal is to try and um, share some knowledge and, and try and find some insight into people's stories um, and their lives. So I appreciate it. Stay tuned. Peace.